As soon as the Second World War broke out, MCC immediately cancelled all remaining first-class cricket. The club's secretary, Colonel Ray Kerr, and his assistant, Ronnie Aird, were both mobilised into the army. And Lords was left in the capable hands of the grand old man, Sir Pelham Warner, who served as acting secretary throughout the war. Now, unlike the First World War, this time Britain was better prepared. As early as 1938, the, the London Fire Brigade had been using the ground, and members of staff were encouraged to join the Auxiliary Fire Service. Trenches were dug, extra firefighting equipment was purchased, and some 2,000 sandbags strategically placed uh, to protect the buildings. A Home Guard unit was set up in Grove End Road. In March, a barrage balloon was sighted on the nursery ground and a searchlight detachment was established. By September, all the windows had been taped up and blacked out. Air raid, shel shel air raid shelters had been built and the club's valuable art collection relocated to the safety of two country houses near Bletchley. During the war, MCC staff was much depleted, but those who remained maintained a program of club, school and forces matches. Sir Pelham Warner felt very strongly that to suspend cricket at Lord's would hand Dr Goebbels a valuable propaganda weapon. And it was widely felt that cricket could be uh, a, an important morale booster on the home front. The 1942 fixture list shows matches played between barrage balloon men, auxiliary firemen, home guard units, anti-aircraft gunners and civil defence workers, all relishing their chance to play cricket at Lord's. Although many of the game's finest performers also appeared here. The Royal Australian Air Force formed its own team which played regularly here from 1943 and spectators got their first sight of a dashing young flying officer who could bowl very fast and bat rather well too. His name, Keith Miller. During the Second World War nearly a million people paid to watch cricket at Lords and some £23,000 was raised for war charities. Now, although the buildings around the ground were quite badly damaged during the Blitz, Lords came through relatively unscathed. In October 1940, a petrol bomb landed. Pelham Warner used to relate how when, it, how when it burst open, there appeared a photograph of a leering German officer with the words, with compliments, written on it. The buildings in Grove End Road were quite badly damaged, and number six Grove End Road was completely destroyed one night although mercifully only one life was lost in that raid. In December, another high explosive bomb landed on the ground itself, resulting in an enormous crater. But that was very quickly filled in by the Lord's ground staff. A number of smaller incendiary bombs also found their targets, but thanks to the sterling efforts of the Lord's firefighting crew, aided by the RAF, very little damage was done to the stands. In fact, the only real casualty of the war was Father Time, and he was a victim of friendly fire. He was dislodged from his perch on top of the grandstand one night by the cables of a stray barrage balloon which had broken its moorings and spent the rest of the Second World War in the relative safety of the committee room. When the V2 rockets began arriving in 1944, Lords was again lucky. Perhaps the most memorable incident happened on the 29th of July during a match between the Army and the, and the RAF. It was feared that a rocket would land on the nursery ground. Players and umpires immediately fell flat on the field while spectators cowered in their seats until the danger passed. Everybody here that day got together and they formed the Buzz Bomb Club, which still meets at Lords for reunions. Now, I got my first taste of service life when I was called up to Lords in 1943. We were, we were billeted in local flats and during the two weeks that we spent here were subject to medical examinations and aptitude tests. We were given our kit and given what seemed like endless vaccinations. At times, the long room floor was littered with the inert bodies of young airmen who'd fainted at the sight of the enormous needles. When we weren't being poked, prodded or examined, we marched. We marched from our billets to breakfast, which we had in a canteen overlooking the monkey house at London Zoo. Then to Lords for morning exercises. Back to the canteen for lunch and then in the afternoons down to Marylebone Public Baths for water training then back here for more drilling until we were finally dismissed at the end of the day. We were issued with vouchers for our evening meals, and most of us spent these in the local Lions corner houses. 
Between 1941 and 1944, some 44,000 military personnel passed through Lords. And in 1992, Air Chief Marshal Sir Peter Harding unveiled a plaque on the wall of the pavilion to commemorate those men. And it was a great thrill to be invited back here in 2009 during the Australian One Day International to celebrate the 65th anniversary of air crew reception at Lords. There was hardly a dry eye amongst us that day when a Lancaster bomber flew over the ground. Sadly, as with the First World War, cricket suffered its losses in the second. Among them, test cricketers Ken Farnes, Maurice Turnbull and Hedley Verity. The MCC lost 282 members, including the Duke of Kent, who was killed in a military air crash in 1942, the first member of the royal family to die on active service for 500 years. However, once the war was over, it became clear that the public's appetite for cricket was undiminished. Huge crowds attended the unofficial victory tests against Australia in 1945, with 85,000 people attending the three days of the Lord's Test, raising some £2,000 for war charities. Field Marshal Montgomery turned up one afternoon and received a standing ovation as he made his way to the committee room. The highlight, though, of that season was the match between England and the Dominions, the teams captained by Wally Hammond and Leary Constantine. Hammond made a century in each innings, while the highlight of the Dominions batting was a glittering 187 by Keith Miller. 16 sixes were struck in that match, which was won by the Dominions by 45 runs, with just six minutes to spare. In September, Colonel Ray Kerr and Ronnie Aird returned to Lords to relieve a weary Pelham Warner, then aged 72. At the AGM, the committee reported that Lords had been decommissioned and life was slowly returning to normal. Once again, many of the nation's war leaders were given honorary life membership of the club, among them Field Marshal Viscount Alexander and Marshal of the RAF Viscount Portal, both of whom were later to serve as presidents. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was also given honorary life membership, although we're not sure he ever came to Lords or even that he knew what cricket was. So the 1946 season began without a hitch. Father Time was back in position to witness Jack Robertson and Sid Brown opening the batting for Middlesex. They emerged for the first time together through the middle doors of the pavilion. The committee having decided the previous winter that men who had fought alongside each other should no longer be segregated in their dressing room. So here at Lords began the end of the distinction between gentlemen and players.